At midnight on the 9th of March 1892 in Memphis, Tennessee, three African Americans were dragged from their shared cell in Shelby County Jail by a horde of masked white men. They were hauled into a nearby field where they were tortured, mutilated and shot. The victims of this public lynching were Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell and Will Stewart, co-owners of the People's Grocery Store. The three men had been arrested after a rival white grocer, W.H. Barrett, had entered the People's Grocery Store and pistol whipped the clerk, McDowell. When McDowell defended himself, Barrett returned with 12 police deputies and an arrest warrant. As a crowd of 75 masked vigilantes gathered to demand vengeance for perceived outrages done to Barrett, the state militia surrounded the jail to prevent a lynching. But then a Tennessee judge ordered the soldiers to disarm, leaving Moss, McDowell and Stewart defenseless. Thomas Moss's dying words were, Tell my people to go west. There is no justice for them here. There was nothing particularly unusual about the people's grocery store lynching. Lynching was increasing year on year. Where this event does differ, however, is that among the grieving black population of Memphis stood a rising civil rights activist, newspaper editor and personal friend of the murdered Thomas Moss. Her name was Ida B. Wells, and her subsequent campaign against lynching was to have repercussions that echo to the present day. I'm Luke Pierce, and this is the Radical History Channel, where we talk about the heroes, the heroines, and the campaigners who fought for democratic and social freedoms through the ages. Ida B. Wells is one of the brightest and most overlooked stars of the early civil rights movement. She was a trailblazer, a feminist, suffragist, investigative reporter and civil rights leader. Above all, she is remembered for exposing the truth about lynching in the United States. By changing the narrative and the warped perception of black Americans, Wells laid the foundations for future civil rights progress. Wells was born a slave in 1862 in Holly Springs, Mississippi, and freed after the end of the Civil War. She was raised by politically active parents who instilled in her the importance of education. She began to exhibit a radical spirit at a young age. She was expelled from Rust College after challenging the university's educational policy. When her parents died from yellow fever, the 16-year-old Wells became a teacher in order to keep her younger siblings together. Her sense of self-determination drew dislike within the African-American community where she was condemned for violating traditional patriarchal etiquette. Irked by this injustice, Wells became even more determined and moved the family to Memphis, where she found teaching work. It was in Memphis, aged only 21 and 75 years before Rosa Parks, that Ida B. Wells refused to give up her seat. Wells regularly travelled to work by train, but one day in September 1883, the conductor forcibly tried to remove her from the first-class ladies' coach. Wells would not give in and, as she put it herself, fastened her teeth on the back of his hand. With the help of other men and to the applause and cheers of the white passengers, the conductor finally shoved Wells off at the next stop, leaving her torn and bruised at an unknown station. Wells hired a lawyer and successfully sued the Chesapeake, Ohio and Southeastern Railroad Company for $500. Although the ruling was overturned by the state Supreme Court three years later, by then Wells had cemented her position as a Memphis civil rights leader, balancing teaching work with radical journalism. After Wells started writing articles criticising radical inequalities within the education system, she was fired from her teaching job in 1889. But as the newly elected secretary of the Afro-American Press Association, this gave her the time to pour herself into the Memphis Free Speech, an African-American newspaper dedicated to tackling racial injustices. By the time of the People's Grocery Store lynching, Wells was already part owner and full-time editor of Free Speech. The lynching of Moss, McDowell and Stewart lit a fire under Wells and sent her on a crusade against lynching that would last until her death. Wells wrote a blistering editorial demanding the arrest and conviction of the lynchers. She wrote that the events surrounding the people's grocery store opened my eyes to what lynching really was, an excuse to get rid of Negroes who were acquiring wealth and property and thus keeping the race terrorised. When the white authorities refused to bring the lynchers to justice, Wells decided to play the whites at their own game. If economics was what truly mattered, then she would hit them where it hurt. She wrote, The city of Memphis has demonstrated that neither character nor standing avails the Negro if he dares to protect himself against the white man or become his rival. There is nothing we can do about the lynching now, as we are outnumbered and without arms. There is therefore only one thing left that we can do, save our money and leave a town which will neither protect our lives and property nor give us fair trial in the courts, but takes us out and murders us in cold blood when accused by white persons. In response, 6,000 
and African Americans left Memphis within two months, stagnating the city's economy. After three months, an unprecedented meeting of white citizens passed a resolution condemning the lynching, but not punishing it. It wasn't enough. To address lynching on a broader scale, Wales had to change the way that it was understood. To do that, she had to alter perceptions of African Americans. In her first pamphlet, Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases, she wrote, Somebody must show that the Afro-American race is more sinned against than sinning, and it seems to have fallen on me to do so. The Afro-American race is not a bestial race. If this work can contribute in any way towards proving this, I shall feel I have done my race a service. Lynching was bound up in a narrative of chivalry, in which white Southerners justified the murder of black men by claiming they were avenging the honour of white women who had been raped. This bogus chivalric narrative cast African Americans in the role of villains, and their lynchers as noble vigilantes. Wells argued, Humanity abhors the assailant of womanhood, and this charge upon the Negro at once placed him beyond the pale of human sympathy. The trope played into a generalised perception of black American men as violent and dangerous. Wells theorised that in many cases, black Samsons were betrayed by white Delilahs, women who had entered consensual relationships with black men and only cried rape when they were caught or forced to do so. The only way Wells could prove such cases was by personally visiting lynching sites and submerging herself in accounts photographs and physical evidence. The courage of her decision to do this can't be underestimated. As a lone black woman in a racist society with no protection from the law, Wells went into communities that had condoned murder and started asking questions that no one wanted to answer. She was accompanied only by a concealed handgun she had bought after the people's grocery store lynching. She said, I had already determined to sell my life as daily as possible if attacked. I felt if I could take one lyncher with me, this would even up the score a little bit. Despite threats from white newspapers such as the Daily Commercial and the White Scimitar, Wells persevered. She narrowly escaped a lynching herself when the free press offices were burned to the ground. After three months of investigations, Wells published her research in graphic and horrifying books and pamphlets. She reported that 728 African-American men and women were lynched between 1883 and 1891. While a third of them had been charged with rape, Wells confirmed that many of those cases were in fact consensual relationships. Among other heinous crimes, one man was killed for writing a letter to a white woman, one for throwing stones, another for having smallpox. Six men were lynched for the crime of self-defense under attack. Wells has been described as an early data reporter, one of the first people to tally the lynchings and their causes. But she went a step further. By putting names, stories and context to her lynching statistics, she helped to correct the perception of the victims as miscreants representative of a degenerate race. And in doing that, she challenged the narrative used by racists to suppress, terrorise and control African Americans. After the attempted lynching at the free speech offices, Wells couldn't return to Memphis. She spent the next three decades in Chicago, writing for various national newspapers. She received funding for an anti-lynching lecture tour of the United States, but still faced great resistance from the entrenched racism of society. Wells continued her crusade for decades, juggling the demands of family and journalism. She targeted legislators, tirelessly lobbied Congress for anti-lynching laws, and corresponded with Presidents McKinley and Wilson. She even completed two lecture tours of Great Britain and attempted to mobilise the British public into shaming the United States. In 1909, Wells was a founding member of the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People, and in 1930 she ran for the Senate. She didn't win, but her campaign brought her cause to an even broader public. Ida B. Wells saw herself as a crusader, a holy warrior, and she welcomed comparisons to Joan of Arc. She was happiest leading from the front, which was both one of her great qualities and faults. Wells struggled to cooperate effectively with other civil rights leaders or participate in organisations where she wasn't the head. She may have helped found the NAACP, but she was considered by many within it to be too militant and dangerous, too unwilling to compromise or to tolerate opinions contrary to her own. Wells was a leading voice in the campaign for female suffrage and even chose to keep her own name in marriage, but she was disowned by the white suffrage movement after she revealed the role of white southern women in the rape allegations against black men. She was, as the African-American historian Thomas Holt describes her, a lonely warrior. Perhaps this is a reason why she was relegated to the footnotes of history, or perhaps it's just because she was a black woman who dared to speak out.
On the surface, Wells failed because lynching was still a significant problem long after her death. But in reality, she was a trailblazer who raised national and international awareness of lynching and the demonization of African Americans with long-lasting effects. Her investigative journalism was groundbreaking in its own right. Her rhetorical skill matched Martin Luther King's and her run for the Senate foreshadowed the successes of Carol Mosley Braun, Barack Obama and Kamala Harris. She even breastfed between speeches, like New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. The killers of the people's grocery store owners may never have been prosecuted. But thanks to a campaign whose origins we can trace all the way back to Ida B. Wells, George Floyd's killers were. Today's Black Lives Matter protesters echo Wells' words, that those who are silent do not see that by their tacit encouragement, their silent acquiescence, they are accomplices, accessories before and after the fact. The great abolitionist, reformer and statesman Frederick Douglass wrote a letter to Wells after the publication of her first pamphlet. He said, let me give you thanks for your faithful paper on the lynch abomination. You have dealt with the facts with cool, painstaking fidelity. Brave woman, you have done your people and mine a service which can neither be weighed nor measured. We have a lot to thank her for as well. If you enjoyed this video, then go ahead and watch this video about another trailblazing woman in black history, Harriet Tubman.